Hey, look at that. Hair in a shattered windshield. That's a head mark. That was made by somebody that found a reason why they didn't want to wear a seatbelt. Hi, I'm Sergeant Jack Ware. And no matter how many of these things we find on wrecked automobiles, there's usually room to live in here. Good looking fella there. Hey. <laughs> Folks, I've brought some friends of mine here. We're going to discuss today why people don't want to wear their seat belts. And one of the reasons I want to do that is because of this number right here. That's how many people die every year in automobile accidents in the United States, 50,000. In my career as a state policeman, that number was up as high as 62,000, and in one time it got down to 34,000, but it, it fluctuates up and down. That's a baseball stadium, or one of the big football stadiums in the country. And, and people, if this program has any effect on you at all, do me a favor. The next time you're in one of those stadiums, when there's nothing happening out here on the field, just stop, stop here and look around at all of those people in that stadium, and then realize that that many people are going to die in a traffic accident in one year in the United States. Well, I've heard in a really bad accident, it's best to be thrown clear of the car. Hey, man, do you see my car? Wasn't it a mess? Boy, I was lucky I was thrown out of there. The policeman told me if I'd have been in that car, I'd have been dead. People, that policeman needs a darn good swift kick. Because he said that to that young man, and the problem with that is that young man is going to take it home and tell his mother, his dad, his brothers, his cousins, all his friends, hey man, policeman told me I was lucky I was thrown out of the car. You know what the policeman didn't tell him? That's the number one killer in automobile accidents. If you want to die in an automobile accident, just get thrown out of the car. Get the picture. Bang, the door pops open and you're flying through the air like a great big bird, you know. <laughs> and you always want to do that. You see the birds going, you want to do that, huh? Run your head into a telephone pole, that smarts. Crosses your eyes, gives you a headache. Or better yet, the door pops open and, and you go sliding down the pavement, you know. By the time you get to those little sharp stones on the shoulder, there's no, uh, there's no seat left in your britches. But hey, we can always find you because there's a bloody smear going across that gravel and down over that little grassy bank, down into that water-filled ditch, and you're sitting down in there saying, boy, am I lucky. Never mind you just skidded the last six feet on a broken beer bottle and your right cheek now is clear up here, and you look up and here comes a friend of yours. He says, move over, Charlie, I want to get in the ditch with you. Your friend? You know who your friend is? It's your car. Let's face it, people, if you get thrown out of the car at the scene of an accident, you're going to go in the direction of the force. What direction is a car going to do? It's going to come the same direction. Only thing is you're out there waiting for it to gobble you up, and that's where policemen find people that get thrown out of the car at the scene of an accident. If you get in an accident, you've got to stay in that car, fastened down, anchored down. Don't take my word for it. Go to the local junkyard. You know where the junkyards are in your area a lot better than I do, but look at the cars in that junkyard. They're smashed here, 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 here. The roofs are caved in. But in 99 and 99 one hundredths, that sounds like an ivory soap commercial, this area right in here is intact. There's room to live if you're in there fastened down, not rattling around like dice in a cup. Hey, if I'm ever in an accident, I'll just reach out and catch myself on the days. Hey, our astronauts sit up here in their spaceship and somebody touches a match to this thing and away it goes, it gains hundreds of miles per hour per second. The thing gets going finally about 25,000 miles an hour. Before these guys can become astronauts, they have to be tested to see how many G's their body can stand. They have to be able to handle seven G's. Seven. You know what 7G's does to you? 7G stretches your mouth out to here like this, flattens your nose out on your face, pushes your eyeballs back in the socket, rolls your forehead up. It's doing the same thing to the rest of their body. <gasps> they can't take a deep breath like that. Their heart has to work under tremendous pressure because every blood vessel in their body is being squeezed shut. That's 7G's. 
a car going 35 miles an hour. Now, a 35 miles an hour, a car hitting a driveway culvert, the back of a stop truck, an overpass abutment, a tree, something that stops that car right now exerts between two and 300 Gs on everything in that car. Two to 300, and I already described what seven Gs does to you. How can I describe two to 300 Gs? You hear the crack of my hand, that force is there and it's gone that quick. If you had to stay in that force field for five seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, do you know how I could best describe what's going to happen to you? Throw a snowball, snowball or a tomato up against that wall. Hey, people, I want you to go for a ride with me a minute, will you? This is my buddy. His name is Harry. He's a, he's, he's a nice guy. Where are we going, Harry? Oh, go on the beach? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, God darn, what do you keep those seat belts there for? The dang things are hard to sit on. You don't wear them, do you? No. You ever had an accident? No, I know it. Darn it, I trust you. Let's go. <laughs> hey, do you see that stop sign? Oh, nobody coming? All right. All right. <laughs> wow. Man, are we ever going? Think of lock my door. <clears throat> Geez, what'll I do if we have an accident? You ever been riding in a car and thought about that? Huh? Huh? You know? Oh, I know. I'll throw up my feet and catch myself. <sighs> you know what happens? You throw up your feet and catch yourself? Swallow your kneecap. Or if you don't swallow your kneecap, you bite it in half, and in the process, you knock half your teeth down your throat. So for the rest of your life, you're... <laughs> Or old Superman, he says, hey, man, I lift weights. Hey, I can, I can put 45 or 450 pounds up there. You know, all the push-ups, hey, I can do them either hand. How many you want me to do? Hey, if I have an accident, hey, I'm going to reach right out here and get a hold of the dash. Boy, I got a grip. What are you going to do with that hand? Oh, hey, I'll stick it in my pocket. No, I won't either. I'm going to, no, no, I'm going to grab a hold up here on this doorpost. Understand they mash their brains out on that thing. Boy, let anybody move me now. I got a grip. Think you can do that, guys? I got a test for you. You guys, I'm not even talking to you gals now. Guys, when you go home, take your wife. She usually weighs less than you do, usually. <laughs> Get a stepladder and help her up on the garage roof. And when she gets up on the garage roof, I say, come on, Harriet, honey, crawl over here to the edge. I want to show you what I learned at that program today. Jump, honey. No, don't use your wife. She, you can't even get her up on the ladder, let alone get her on the garage roof. But have your son go up there. Take, let him take a 100-pound bag of cement up there and drop it. Catch it, guys. Get right under there and catch that 100-pound bag of cement. It's only going to fall a foot and a half. You'll break your back, but that's all right. If you can't catch that, how do you think you can ride down the road, weigh 200 pounds, and ride down the road 15, 20, 30 miles an hour and reach out and grab a hold of the dash and catch yourself? If you still question what I'm saying, I got a test for you. Go home, put on your shorts and a pair of tennis shoes, and get out in your backyard now. And in fact, get back in the shrubbery where your neighbors don't see you because they're going to think you're nuts. And, and when you get back there, look at the back of your house and pick a spot where there's no windows and just kind of draw an imaginary X on it. And when you think nobody's looking, just start running just as fast as you can. How fast can you run? 12, 14 mile an hour? Hey, your, your, your eyes are watering, your hair's blowing behind your head. When you get to the back of the house, don't stop running. Just throw your hands out and catch yourself. Make sure your wife is there to pull your face out of the aluminum siding. Because these things are useless to you people. And hey, you know, you know what I call them? I call them wet noodles. As far as I'm concerned, that's as good as they are in an automobile accident. In fact, let's play a little game. Let's have an accident and do it real slow motion. We reach out here and grab a hold of the dash. And here comes our thumb. Geez, I never did that before. And this finger goes across the dash till it hits the window and just bends over backwards. This one slides sideways and it breaks right here. This one tips over backwards. And this one goes down the defroster hole. As your face goes out through the windshield, beyond it, your hands are caught there in the crevice between the dash and the windshield. These things are useless. You know, in our kids, 
We love them dearly from the time they're this big. We do all of the things that we can do to, to see that they grow up to be big and strong and, and, and have a happy life. You know, we say, whittle away from yourself. Don't whittle towards yourself. You cut your finger. Carry your scissors with a point down. Don't run with that sucker stick in your mouth. Get your finger out of the light socket. You know, we teach them all the good things. And then we take him out in the car and say, come on, Johnny, let's go for a ride. And we stand him up in the front seat of the car. All you have to do is hit your brakes, punch him good, and there, bye, Johnny. There he goes right out through the windshield. Or mother says, here, Johnny, sit on my lap and I'll hold you with my wet noodles. Or dad says, here, Tommy, you stand here behind my wet noodle and I'll hold you in the event we have an accident. That little boy, he only weighs 20 pounds, but in a, in a collision of about 35, 40 miles an hour, his 20 pounds is exaggerated to 600 pounds. Can you imagine catching 600 pounds with his wet noodles? One day I was working traffic patrol, people, and I, I, I saw this a bunch of cars sitting alongside of the road and all of these people looking in the window of this car. And so I got out of my patrol car and I walked up alongside of the car and sitting there in the driver's seat was a, a blonde haired gal about 23 years old and she had a little blonde haired boy in her arms and she was rocking him like that. And when I opened the door I could hear her, she was humming some kind of a little song. And I said, ma'am, what's wrong? My baby's dead. And I said, what, what happened? See, well, well, uh, a, a dog ran out in front of me and, and um, uh, I slammed on the brakes and he fell off the seat and now he's dead. Mm -hmm. I went around the car in the other side and opened the door and there in the dust, dust of the dash was a little half moon mark and there was that same reddened mark on his forehead where he'd been standing up in the seat and slammed forward and hit that dash and broke his neck on the way to the floor. kids are bigger now. They don't need seat belts in the back seat anyway. So now we've got seats that we have to put in the car that the kids have to ride in when they're small and as soon as they get past that stage, they're four or five years old now, we say, all right kids, jump here in the back seat and you can play back there while we're driving. All you're doing with that little kid in the back seat, people, is making a human projectile out of him. If you have to slam on your brakes or if you do have one of these accidents, 25, 30 miles an hour, that kid is going to be just like a rag doll that somebody threw across the room. And hey, you know those little kids, they have a way of getting bigger and bigger and bigger New Year's Eve. And you're having a house party. And, and your wife and, and you are getting your house all set up. And Freddie. Your son comes up and says, hey, Dad, can I take the car tonight? Oh, gee, son, it's New Year's Eve. I don't know. You're only 16. I, I don't know. But he said, Daddy, I don't drink. You know I don't. I'll be careful. Can I take the car? Well, where are you going? Well, I, we're just going over to a house party. Okay, son. But just remember, when, when you're coming home, there's going to be a lot of drunks on the road. Be careful. Okay, Dad. Your party's over with. It's about 1 o'clock and everybody's gone home and, and, and you've got a mess all cleaned up and you're crawling in bed with your wife and you're saying, gee, I wonder how long before Freddie will get home. And you really can't, if, if you're like me and a lot of other parents, you, you can't go to sleep because you're worrying about Freddie. And all of a sudden you hear the garage door come down and you say, oh, geez, he's home. Or there's an alternative, people. You hear a knock on the door. And when that knock comes on the door, you well, know who that is. And you get up and you go to the door and there stands me, a policeman. And I said, sir, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got some bad news. Your son Freddie was killed in an automobile accident tonight. You know, there's really no other way to tell people that. And he said, oh my God, what, what happened? Jeez, I taught him to drive, what did he do? Well, he didn't do anything. It was, it was the other driver, but you know, your son didn't have a seatbelt on. Didn't you, didn't you tell your son to wear his seatbelt? I don't wear a seatbelt because I'm worried about being trapped in my car if it catches on fire in an accident. I talked to a, a class one day a young, of young people, and I, I had an older teacher standing in the back door listening, and I knew the lady. About a week later, I met her on the street. 
And she says, Jack, she says, Jack, you don't wear those seat belts, do you? And I said, well, sure, don't you? She said, why no? And I said, well, why not? She said, well, what if I was involved in an accident and I was knocked unconscious and my car caught a fire, I couldn't get out? What if I was knocked in an accident, I was knocked unconscious and my car caught a fire, I couldn't get out? I said, hey, how many unconscious people you ever seen walking around the scene of an accident? <laughs> I just forgot. You could see the light bulb come on up here. She said, why, you know, you're right. She said, if I was unconscious, it wouldn't make any difference, would it? And I said, no. But hey, I can't blame that lady. Because she's scared of fires, and she's heard about them, and she's seen them, and I'm scared of them. I would hate to be in a car where there's fire. And, and they really do it to you on television. You know, if the hero and the heroine are riding down the road and the hoodlums are shooting at them and all of a sudden their car crashes and they jump out and run across the courthouse yard and fall down there in the grass and they look back at their car and it goes poof. And while you're sitting there, boy, wouldn't it be awful to be in that? We're really getting jammed into that fire episode, making us think, gee, fires are involved in accidents all the time. Fires are involved, people, in less than one half of one percent of our total accident picture. One half of one percent. That, that's not a valid reason for not wearing your seatbelt, people. Hey, I want to take you back with me one more time to an accident that I policed just before I retired. This is an intersection, and there's a stop sign right there and a stop sign right there. My witness to this accident came from this way. Johnny and Freddie came from this way, and Mary and Joni came from this way. I kind of have to set the stage for this thing, people, because it's winter time, and it, it's, it's in February, and it's cold. And, and these young couple, they both went to a different party uh, that night, and they, they probably got to that party about 9 o'clock that night. It was a nice night. But about 10.30 that night, it started to rain, and it rained, and it rained, and it built ice up on everything. And about 1 o'clock that night, people, I was right here on this intersection, and I came up here, and I couldn't stop my car, and it's flat, flatter than a pancake. I couldn't stop my car, so I turned it into the curb, and I slid along that curb, just grating on the curb to get my car stopped. And I got stopped right about here, and I looked, there was no car, there wasn't much traffic out that night, and I turned and went in this way. My partner and I decided we were going to go have a cup of coffee. I got a call on the radio. It said, Jack, you better go to this corner, there's an accident. And I said, hey, no, I was just at that corner, there's no accident. He said, you better go back. He said, it sounds like a bad one. After the accident was all cleaned up, people, I got a chance to talk to that witness. And I said, hey, did you see Freddie's car? And he said, no, I didn't see his car. And I said, well, geez, what'd you see? I wondered wh why he stayed around all of that time when he didn't see anything. I said, well, gee, what'd you see? He said, I saw his headlights. And I said, well, can you describe them? He said, yeah, they, they look like shooting stars. Man, was he carrying the mail. Johnny and Freddie were left their dance and they had had a couple of beers at that dance. We, we don't know how many, but we know they didn't have over three beers apiece. But Johnny and Freddie came out of their dance, and, and when they came out the front door of that place, the ice surprised them. They didn't know it had rained, and they promptly fell right flat on their face. And then they went across the parking lot, hanging on the buildings and cars, until they got to their car, and they had to scrape that much ice off their windshield, people. And when they got in the car, they had to spin it and spin it and spin it to get it moving. And then it had to be fishtailing back and forth like this. Something should have said, hey, Freddy, you can't drive like that on wet ice. Something numbed that thing, apparently. They were coming right here. Mary and Joni, Johnny and Freddy. They met right here. Right there. Joni sat right here, and Mary sat right here. Mary was the driver. She, she, weighed, or she was about five, seven and a half, and she weighed about 140 pounds. She was, she was pretty. She had black, curly hair. 
and the steering wheel. You got a picture of this here, people. The steering wheel sitting here in front of her, and she's hanging on to it. And in that impact, you, the impact was over here. You'd have thought she'd have gone that way and gone this way. She should have, but somehow or another, those cars must have been twisting so violently that instead of doing that, she came right over the top of the steering wheel and, and left a hole in the windshield here. And, and, and there was some of her hair and some of her skirt on the windshield. And she flew through the air and flew all the way over here and ran into a woven wire fence and, and broke her neck. And when I got there, she was standing with her head all twisted around underneath her upside down with one leg draped back up over that fence. Joni, hey, Joni was 5'8". She, she weighed 135 pounds. She had long blonde hair. She was very pretty. And she sat here where this impact came from this side and, and hit this car right here. Again, she should go this way, and then she should go this way outside of the car. But again, somehow or another, people, this door got open. And she fell out of the car, down underneath the car. This right leg here went down underneath this car right here. And then this car, the continuing impact, this wheel assembly was just torn loose and pushed out from under. This wheel, we never found it. We don't know where, where it went. It was just blown out from underneath the car, and that car come right flat down on the pavement. And when it did, then the car was spinning, and it came over here like this and ran into this curb right here. A 10-inch curb with Joni pinned right there between the curb and the car. And 4,000 pounds of car slammed into that curb, crushed Joni, and then the car bounced in the air and went on over here. And Joni came out and left a track through this water slush snow-filled ditch, like a toboggan track down through there. And she was right there when I got there. We came around the corner and stopped there behind their car. And I got out and looked in that car, and there was nobody in there. And I turned around with my flashlight, and I happened to shine it right in her face. There was about this much of her stuck up out of that slushy water. And she was looking right at my flashlight. And, and I walked over there, and I stepped down in that ditch, people, and I went into, into slush above my knees. And I stepped down there alongside of her, and she was looking up at me. I got to go home. I promised my mama I'd come home. I got to go home now. Not in a 19-year-old young lady's voice, but in a little, a little girl's voice. My, my, my mama's waiting for me. I got to go home now. Hey, people, we pulled her up out of that ditch, and we put her on a paper blanket right here. That's when I saw her leg, the one that had been underneath that car. There was no leg anymore, no knee, no ankle, no foot. It was just ground up meat, bone, dirt, grease, ice. Honest to God, it looked like a salt and peppered piece of hamburger. And there was no blood left there so that thing could bleed because she was so mashed up from being between the car and the curb that there was no blood left to get down there. The next day at the autopsy, I told the doctor that, that Joni was alive at that accident scene for almost an hour, and he said, no way, she died almost instantly. Hey, people, I was there. We had to wait for that ambulance to get there, and it seemed like it would never come. When we finally put her in the back of the ambulance that night, we already had Mary in there, and Mary was on the stretcher, and we slid Joni's stretcher alongside of hers, and the attendant was in there, and Joni was still begging the attendant, I got to go home. You can't make me stay here. I want to go home. In that little girl's voice. And, and we closed the ambulance door. It's like the end of a bad story, people. She never made it to the hospital. She died on the way. Johnny and Freddie, Johnny got a cut. It bled right here. It bled down into the middle of the palm of his hand. That's all he got out of that. Freddie never got a scratch. As a policeman, I wanted to put him in jail. I didn't think anybody had a right to do something like that and just walk away from it and continue their life. Hey, I, you know, I got a warrant, but I never served it because seven days later, his mother called the post. She was screaming, you got to come over and help me. My son is destroying our house with an ax. And four of us went over there, and we took that boy out of that house and took him to the hospital in a straitjacket. I know why he did it. You know what Freddie did? Freddie knelt on that paper blanket that night. And you got to get the picture. It's still 30 degrees, and it's still raining. 
and, and he's got his sport coat off, and he's in a white shirt, and he's got that sport coat draped over Joni here, and he's looking down at her, and the tears are running out of his face as big as my fingernail, and he's saying, oh, God, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean it, and, and, and she's looking up at him, but my mom is waiting for me, I can't go home, you can't make me stay here, my mom is waiting, oh, God, I didn't mean it, I, I'm sorry, and there was that piece of meat laying out in front of her, or is it in front of him that he could see? And he kept begging her. People that, like I said, we waited almost an hour for that amulet. And while we were going around cleaning up the mess, there was nothing we could do for Joni. I stopped every once in a while in, in what I was doing and turned and looked at him. And I listened to that young man say, Oh God, I didn't mean it. Won't you please forgive me? People, that's what this is. But you know, I got to come back over here. I, I said, when I, when I first started this program, I said, you got to stay in the car. I, gotta, I couldn't get in this side of the car, but I came around and got in this side, into Mary's side of the car. There was no damage on her side of the car, nothing. The steering wheel wasn't even bent. I don't know how she could get her body five foot seven and a half, how she could unwrap around that steering wheel and go out through the windshield without bending the steering wheel. But I, I, I slid across that seat and tangled up in the seat in the middle of the seat, the seat belts was her little black sequin purse. It had her wallet and some com cosmetics in it. And that little purse stayed there, tangled up in the seat belts. In that impact that happened, that purse had to hook that belt and then just stay there. She didn't have to die. If she'd had a seat belt on people, she could have stood here and told you about that accident. Joni, hey, I don't know whether jo Joni could have handled that or not, but let's face it, people, all the injuries she got, her leg and being crushed and her insides all being crushed was all with her outside of the car. No damage from the inside of the car, from that impact when she was inside of the car. Again, one more that got thrown out of the car. I got to come back up here. This is a wide open area. She had to see that shooting star just like he did. What was Mary doing? Lighting a cigarette? Putting on lipstick? Was she saying, hey, Joni, did you see the beautiful man I danced with? Did Joni happen to look up and see that car coming? Mary, look out! Honest to God, people, that's what that is. That's all you got time for. You don't have time to say, hey, wait a minute, I'll put on my seatbelt. Wait a minute, I'll throw my hand up here. Wait a minute, I'll brace my legs. Look out! Bang! I had to go to Joni's mother, and I knocked. I walked up on the back porch of that house, and and knocked on the door. And a hall light came on, and I saw Joni coming down the hallway, putting on a house coat. Joni, twenty years older. I didn't know that that lady, her mother, had had lost her husband six months before that. I didn't know that Joni was all she had left in the world, but as a policeman, I had a message that I had to deliver. And I've found over the years that it's just easiest to hit them bang and get it over with. So when she came to the door, I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I got some bad news. Joni was killed in an automobile accident tonight. She knocked me right off the porch. I never even saw her hand coming, but hey, it was four o'clock in the morning. I was soaking wet didn't hurt me, I got back up, and I went in the house, and I held that woman in my arms while she shuddered and cried. And then when she finally got under control, I had to take her to the hospital to identify her daughter. She didn't have to see this leg, and she didn't have to see her inside where she was mashed up here, but she did have to look at the terror and the pain etched in her face and say, yeah, that's my daughter, that's my, do that's my Joni. You see why I started with this figure, people? 50,000. Can you imagine, do you have a family at home? You're going to, how you love them and how you watch them grow and the things you do with them. Can you imagine having to go to the hospital and say, yeah, that's my son, that's my daughter. I got one little further message to lay on you. 
in the 23 years that I was a state policeman, I never unbuckled a dead person in an automobile accident. Never. Thank you. I don't have to buckle up anymore. My car automatically buckles me in. Hey, look at this. This is an automatic shoulder harness. And when I close this door, this is going to close across my chest. Most people think that this is all they have to do, that they're buckled in. But in reality, what they've got to do is reach down here, get a hold of this lap belt, and bring it over here and snap it in. Now they're buckled in. Hey, look, folks. Here's another one of those automatic shoulder harnesses. I close the door, and I've got it on. But the problem is it's only half of the seatbelt system in this car. You still have to reach down here on the floor, get the seatbelt, bring it across your lap, and snap it in. Then if you have an impact, your weight is held here in the seat, and the shoulder harness can keep you off the steering wheel or off the door post or the dash. Folks, I recommend that anyone that has a shoulder harness or a seat belt that's fastened to the door make a conscious effort to lock your door. This can help prevent the door popping open in some accidents, and this just helps improve the effectiveness of the whole system. I don't need seat belts anymore. My new car has an airbag. In order for this airbag to be effective, this shoulder harness and seat belt have to be fastened. Airbags are designed to be deployed in front end crashes. Hey, you know, a study by Ford Motor Company of a government airbag fleet showed that in only 12% of the accidents did the airbag deploy. In 88% of the accidents, there was no airbag. Hey, people. You know, these airbags are designed to protect you in one impact. If you have a second or third impact without the seat belt and shoulder harness on, you have nothing. You know, today we simulated a head-on impact. If you have any other kind of collision, a side, a rear, a rollover, the airbag is still going to be in the steering wheel. You know, when I first started talking about seat belts, we had about 10% of the people in this country wearing their seat belts. Now we're up to somewhere near 50%. Hey, you know, I'm going to keep making these programs till we get just as many people as possible in their seat belts. Please, people, let's not go backward. If you have a car equipped with an airbag, Remember, you still have to buckle this three-point harness. And if you've got an automatic shoulder harness that comes out of your door or out of the door post, you still have to buckle the lap belt. Remember, people, in here there's room to live.